Um, basically, why they're out here is the government caused the problem, um, and I know that's never happened before, and it probably won't ever happen again. Um, but they sent the military to fix it, so that's where these guys come in. <coughs> Excuse me. So these guys are, once again, they're the elite. If you notice, I am not wearing a red, white, and blue uniform. I am not wearing something that you think of like a Revolutionary War soldier in uniform, which is our common infantrymen. I'm wearing basically camouflage. Um, they've been given a frock coat, and this was a very American coat. If you look at my hat, it's called a Shaco. Not only is it super cool looking, but it's also very wobbly. It's pretty much useless. It's very hot. It's made out of leather. Um, if I lean one way, that's the way it goes. So it looks cooler than it actually is. Um, but this is very European. Whereas this coat, this frock coat, uh, George Washington said this was a very American coat. He preferred this because it made us look like Americans. Rather, this made us look like Europe. Um, so they were given specialized clothing, camouflage clothing. If I'm fighting the British and you're wearing red, if I walk up next to, I'll say I'm hiding in the woods and you're hiding and you're standing in a huge line of red soldiers, who you're probably going to see first? Guy in the red, right? I'm a sniper. Uh, basically, I'm going to hide in the woods. And so I've been given specialized equipment and a specialized weapon. What you're going to hear some of these other guys talking about is some of the weapons and the technology that changes. Um, as technology changes, you, generally speaking, our tactics change. How many of you have seen images of Iraq and Afghanistan with guys lining up in big giant lines, <laughs> shooting each other 50 yards away? Anybody? I don't think so, right? As technology changed, so our tactics. Well, this was a wonderful piece of technology. This is a flintlock weapon, and, uh, and you're going to hear a couple other guys talking about that too. But basically how this works, when I pull the hammer back, that piece of flint's going to fly forward, hit that piece of steel, and it's going to cause sparks to come off of it because that piece of flint is harder than that steel. It cuts off a hot piece of metal and forces it into the gunpowder, which I put inside that little pan. There's a hole inside that pan that goes inside the barrel. That goes off, sets off the main charge, gun goes off. Uh, this has been in the 1600s. You're starting to see some flintlocks being used. Um, fantastic piece of machinery at the time. This is the premier weapon. But that's not what makes the difference. It's this barrel. You can see that's smooth on the outside. It is not smooth like that on the inside. There's little rifling grooves that are spinning all the way to the top. So you kids throw a football, we want that football to spiral, right? You don't want that football. You see on the NFL, you don't see tumbling footballs, do you? You see those beautiful spirals that they like to take pictures of, all right? And basically the same principle with this bullet. It's going to grab those grooves and it's going to put a spiral on it. It goes farther, it goes faster, and it's more accurate. The British at the time are using smooth bore guns. It means the inside of their barrels are smooth on the as the outside is. That bullet is bouncing inside that, that inside that barrel. And it's basically going in the direction of the last place it bounces. Very inaccurate, 50 or 60 yards tops. But they can load very quickly because the bullet's small, smaller than that. They could drop down the bottom, ram it in, no big deal three, four times a minute if they're fast, and the British were fast. Me, on the other hand, I'm not going to line up with them in a big straight line because I'm shooting a rifle. It takes about a minute for me to load because I have to beat that bolt to the bottom, and I want that bolt to be tight. So I'm not going to stand up open field when they can shoot three or four times at me. I'm going to get back at 100 or 300 yards, and I'm going to make every shot count. Every time I pull the trigger, somebody's going to die. And so they were given specialized weapons. This is an 1803 Harper's Ferry. And it was basically the first military rifle made by the military for the military. That will continue on up until today. Same thing, our troops that are in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're not going to the local pawn shop and getting an American-made, possibly a civilian-made gun. They're getting military-made weapons, right? Same thing here. This, this was the first one. And I had to qualify with this at 100 and 300 yards. How many of y'all have shot a flintlock at 300 yards? That's a long shot. That's a good shoot. These guys are very good. And so they were given specialized weapons, specialized equipment. And if I, I'm, I'm going to be shooting as an infantryman basically today. I have my pouch in the back that has my set rounds. Thank you. I'm using, if I'm not going to shoot a blank, I'm not going to shoot a live round day, but I'd be shooting a, a round ball. Basically, I'd tear that pouch open and put a little bit of gunpowder inside this, close that up because I don't want my gunpowder to fall out and I'd load it down the barrel. Um, but if I wanted to make a very specialized shot, say like a good sniping shot, I would not use this pouch. This is pre-measured, depending on the distance, and humidity, a lot of different uh, things would go into uh, account. I'd be using my uh, gunpowder horns here where I could make a very precise charge for that exact shot. So I can make my good sniping shots out of these powder horns with good quick shots out of this, but they're already paired, rip them open and go. 